Hey everybody, welcome. It's Thursday night. Crawl Spaces Gossip Pod is back. It's 9 p.m. Eastern and we are being joined by two very special guests. One is Maggie Freeling down below right there and the other is Detective Cloyd Steiger. What is up? Not much. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you? Um, Good. A couple, a couple of statistics here. Uh, Cloyd has solved 350 homicides. That's or one two fifty between two fifty and three fifty. So I thought I thought you I, th- I thought you saw no, another two fifty. The- yeah, I did. Well, this morning before breakfast, right? That's, just, you know. <laughs> that's great, and that's the same amount of uh, tattoos that Maggie has. Yeah, that's right. How convenient. That's true. Mm. Mm. Like how I really forced that introduction. We have met before. I don't think we have. No, I don't think so. Well, nice to meet you. Yes, <laughs> Maggie, Cloyd, Cloyd, Maggie. I love that. Great. Uh, Maggie is an investigative journalist out of New York. Uh, we were on a television show called The Disappearance of Maura Murray with her, Cloyd. Oh, I've and, heard of that case. Oh, yeah. It's, very, uh, <laughs> it's a very compelling case. And um, Maggie, Cloyd has written two fantastic books that I recently <laughs> read. I read them both. Read them. Oh, okay, I did my Googling this morning, so I knew you wrote the books. But <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. yeah, these books are excellent. They're called Homicide, The View from Inside the Yellow Tape and Seattle's Forgotten Serial Killer, Gary Jean Grant. Oh, right there. He's got the <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there Love you go. It. Yeah. Did you work on Israel Keys at all? I did not, although uh, my old partner, who's probably watching this, did. He did some work on it because he was doing cold cases and I wasn't. I was doing fresh cases when that was all going on. All right. And then there was another one. There was Bundy. Did you work on Bundy? No, because he got arrested just before I got on the police department. Oh, wow. Yeah, because okay. yeah, he was arrested in like 78, 79. I came okay. out in 79, yeah. Oh, wow. Although I've done a lot of stuff past that about Bundy, about trying to link him to other cases that he hasn't been uh, right. linked to. And so it, peripherally I have, but I didn't work right. on the original cases at all. There's a right. rumor that Ted Bundy once said that he wished he'd been caught by you, Cloyd. Yeah, I know. I've read that. Yeah, I you actually wrote that. that. <laughs> oh, you wrote that. I wrote that, but I mean, oh. you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. good stuff. Doesn't everybody though. Doesn't everybody really. <laughs> <laughs> well you have arrested serial killers though i have yeah Couple yeah it's yeah. pretty wild um yeah, yeah you, your memoir is uh is outstanding everyone listening right now please pick it up it is a quick mm-hmm. read uh it, it you covered so many different cases in there so many different kinds of murder investigations it was right really quite remarkable to read and then you put some personal stuff in there but I yeah. especially liked how you didn't you didn't hesitate to talk shit about any of your former employer uh, employers or employees uh, friends. Even <laughs> if uh, if you were like, yeah, you know, he was good sometimes, but you know, once in a while, yeah. he was really terrible. Or whatever. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's everybody is really, aren't we all? We're really good sometimes, and shit the rest <laughs> this is true well michelle has uh posted the link to your book um oh thank you michelle yep yep so she's posted the link up there and then she continues and says uh while you're at it set your amazon smile to private investigations for the missing because that is the charity that will go um that's the charity that'll be sponsored when you purchase that on amazon smile right so uh, maggie actually we've been trying to get maggie on the show for a little while uh, but schedules and you know ice chicken salad and chicken salad. Oh, chicken, salad. Uh, chicken salad, yes, yes, that happened last week. Right. Uh, <laughs> I take it it wasn't good. No, no, it was not good. Yeah. <laughs> no, the whole thing. I hope homemade chicken salad takes a while. So yeah, yeah. a little long. It was the process of making it, though, Cloyd. I think you were <laughs> you were you were thinking it was the process of uh, so eating it. Yeah, digesting it. Digesting it. Yeah. Digesting it. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. The whole thing. Exactly. So we so asked Maggie. Maggie to, oh, sorry. Go on. No, no, you oh, you. Oh, please, no, you. Please. Please. No, you. Please. No, you. I don't. No. no, I don't want. I don't want to step on your. <laughs> First argument ever, right here. Get vocal. Um, no, Maggie wanted to come on. Uh, we wanted her to to come on, and we were like, "What are we going to talk about?" And she is very passionate about the the current movement with police reallocation of funds and and defunding. That's sort of the buzzword that's out there now. And we we said, "Well, we know some law enforcement. We know probably the best guy in law enforcement who can speak to this on a you know more of an expert 
level than than what we could as podcasters. Um, so I guess the <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. But um, podcasters, you're experts in everything. Oh, that that That's is right. true. Yeah. Uh, but so, so yeah, thank you for joining us, Cloyd, for this, because it's, um, I know it's a topic that Maggie feels strongly about, and it's just cool to have a, a platform for a healthy debate or a healthy conversation. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I talked to Art on the, Art Roderick, uh, on the phone, you know, for like an hour today about it. We talk all the time, but you know, today I was like, you know, I'm going to be talking to Cloyd and, um, I don't know if you, I don't think you guys know each other, but he was, you know, familiar with your work. He's a retired U.S. Marshal that I worked on the oh, yeah. case with. Yeah. yeah. We were just talking about, you know, talking points for the evening. Because he, you know, he also feels pretty strongly about, um, you know, uh, reallocating funds so police don't have to do everything all the time, you know? Right. So... That's what Art and I talked about. <laughs> I work with, I, I work with a lot of US Marshals. They're great guys. I call them my man hunters. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so Art was at Ruby Ridge. Um, oh, was he? Yeah. God, what a mess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh so Chloe, what are your thoughts? We we I guess we just heard in brief uh what, what Maggie's feelings are. Um I think the headline or whatever the words defund the police, um, maybe a little bit misleading based on what it seems like is actually being talked about. But uh, what are your thoughts on this whole thing, Cloyd? Well, you know, I know that patrol officers and police officers are tasked to do a lot of things that they weren't traditionally tasked to do. And they're thrown into a lot of other things. The problems I see is when I hear people saying, you know, we should send mental health professionals there or social workers. There's a reason like in domestic violence situations or the guy who's a little crazy acting weird, 95% of the time, those work out just fine, but that 5% is going to be really bad. And, you know, that's where stuff can go really wrong really fast. And if people are going to get hurt. Now, I don't know if you mean send this person with the police so the police can protect them. I, I'm, I'm more interested in that. But I wouldn't want to be the mental health professional or the social worker that goes to a domestic violence thing because, you know, most, most cops, more cops are killed at domestic violence events than anything else because passions are high and things like that. And it doesn't matter how much talking you do. If this person is uh, pen on, uh, ready for violence, it's going to happen. And, you know, you got to those are those are real, you know, it's real dangerous areas to be into. Now, again, I don't have a problem with. Having somebody go with the police, so if things go down the tubes real quickly, the police can protect them. But, you know, that's dangerous ground. I mean, it's a nasty, nasty situation. And things can go, you know, things can go from perfectly fine, calm, to just snap in a second and everything's going south. And it's it's not good. And so that's, that's the thing. I think people, I think some people in general are a little naive about what goes on in these things and how, we can just talk to these people. Well, sometimes you can, most of the time you can, but sometimes you can't, you know, some people, first of all, the person that's there may be intent on homicide, suicide anyway, you know? So, I mean, that's the stuff. And no matter how much you talk nice, it's not going to end well. I think, I think, you know, one of the things that um, really brought, you know, how difficult this would be, you know, to light for me was, watching the Richard Brooks video, um, yeah. you know, that to me, I think is kind of, um, when we're talking about, you know, all these police brutality cases, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, I think that one's kind of an anomaly in the sense that the police did show up doing the right thing. They showed up with de-escalation in mind. And when right. I saw that video at first, I was like, oh, well, these aren't the two cops that killed him. These guys, see, they're fine. They're doing the right thing. They're they're trying to, you know, get him out of the way, talking nice mm -hmm. to him. Nothing's going to go wrong. It must be someone else who shows up. And then it just went so bad so fast. That happens all the time, too. It happens all the time. It doesn't necessarily end in somebody getting killed, necessarily, but it can end in somebody being very badly hurt, and whether it's the police or the suspect. And things can go south very, very quickly. And and that's a, that's the problem. It's the volatile situation. You don't know what's in this guy's mind. Well, we know now he's on probation. He got out of jail. He thinks if he goes to jail for this DUI, he's going back to prison. He ain't going back to prison. And, and it doesn't matter what you say to him. So the fight is on. I mean... So that in happens all the time. like that, I mean, they everything started off fine. And of course, you know, the argument in it is, is that, you know, he he resisted arrest. He stole their taser, you know, 
Art made the point that that is considered a deadly weapon because I said, right. you know, why shoot him? He was running away. And I'm not saying I agree or disagree with right, this. Right. I'm just saying, how could that situation have better been? How, how do we walk out of that without, without someone losing their life? Well, we don't know. And you never know. That's the problem. None of these things are predictable when you go in, right? They're unpredictable. And normally, these type, this is a relatively routine thing, right? He was... What in Washington State we call that he was in physical control, which is the same as a DUI because he's behind the wheel and he's drunk, and you know that happens hundreds of thousands of times every night in this country, and it usually doesn't end like that. And it's just like, but you know the person, you know, go to go to jail, fight it in court. Yeah, you know that's how we end up with people still being alive. Don't resist. Don't do that. It's like a, a very poor decision. The officers were not mean they weren't being rude they're very polite but you know once he starts fighting and he tries to take away their taser and you know uh, the thing about a taser not only is it a deadly weapon if he tased that officer then the officer is disabled he could have taken his gun right. killed him and the other officer yeah right. that stuff happens a lot you know that's the thing so these are not you know there's no easy this is this is not there's no easy answer to any of this stuff that's why you know it's just, it's like I used to say, that's why I get paid the big bucks, but <laughs> not really <laughs> because it's, it's so dynamic and it just is, it's unpredictable. It's very unpredictable. The, the only way that you can cause these is the person don't resist, don't fight, go with the officers. That's why we have courts. You can fight this in court. You can do it every, if you think you were wrong, there are, there are, there are ways to handle that, but fighting and resisting is not one of them because it won't end very well. I think, you know, and something that you, that, you know, you wouldn't be able to answer, but just a point to make is like, you know, you go to court, but then you also have to deal with systemic racism in court as a black man, you know, with these, these charges against you. So I think, you know, I, I think in that situation, personally, my mind would go to, yeah, it would be great to have had a de-escalation specialist, even though it does seem like those officers were very well trained in that. Um, it would have, you know, been nice to have someone who was dispatched with the police that could have maybe, you know, when he started resisting arrest, talked him down uh, another outside person there. And then I guess it just, yep. dude, where do we get the funding for that? You know, where do it? Well, <laughs> and the other thing, not, not that's that's a little bit of a pipe dream, because once that guy starts fighting, it doesn't matter who talks to him. Nice. If it's, you know, I've been there in situations like first of all, I haven't worked patrol for 30 years, right? So it's a long time ago for me that I last worked patrol. But you could have a family member tell them, calm down, calm down. It doesn't matter because once they're gone, they're gone. You know, it's not, it's just like you when you get mad. If, if someone's at, they're telling you a, a, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a family member, calm down, calm down. Sometimes it just makes you more pissed. Right? Things, they don't <laughs> angry. I tell my boyfriend that all the time, you know? Yeah. Don't tell me. That. I don't want to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't say that. There's that and so it's, really and great it's, it's, where it's like the washing machine, like spinning. And then it's like right. a girlfriend, when I tell her to calm down and someone throws a brick in the whole machine, just like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's exactly right. And it's no different for most people. It's not going to, by that time it's too late. You know, you can do that. First of all, this whole de-escalation de thing, everybody talks like that's a brand new thing. That's been around forever and ever. Sometimes you can de-escalate. Most of the time you can, but sometimes you just can't. You try, but it doesn't work. You know, that's the thing. And, and uh, you know, having a third party and, and that, first of all, they wouldn't send a third party to, they can't send a third party to every routine call that the police go. Well, on, right? here's another thing too, yeah. is that the, um, was it, a, it was a Wendy's, the Wendy's employee chose to call the police. She didn't call, right. uh, you know, a social worker, but I guess, you know, where are those resources? Who could be yeah. called in that instance? You know, he even said, I live down the street. I can walk home. So like, yeah, is there something? The only problem is yeah. he, he walks away. You let him go. He walks away. He comes back, gets his car, drives and kills somebody. And then the police are on, you know, that's the thing. He, you can't let him walk away. You have to take him somewhere until you make sure he sobers up because that stuff happens. I mean, I used to, I, I never liked doing DUIs, right? I was never a DUI guy. And I, before they had interior trunk releases, I can't tell you how many sets of keys I, I locked in trunks and drove away, but that's just me. But if he, if the person gets in a car after you had him stopped and under control and then drives away and kills somebody, then the city will get sued or the state or whoever. And not only that, how bad do you feel that you, this, you know, some innocent person got killed because you let this guy, you cut this guy a break. You can let him walk away. He has to go somewhere at least sober up before he walks away. That's that's the reality of it. Yeah. It's it's much more complex than it sounds, right? Normally in a good world, you can't go ahead, go over to your sisters and sleep it off. But you can't trust that. 
because he, he may not stay at his sister's. He may leave him, or he may get hit by a car himself walking home and get killed. And somebody, you should have held him. He wouldn't be killed today. You know, there's so many variables. It's just like, yeah, it doesn't, the real world doesn't work that way. So I guess um, I'm hijacking your show, you guys. So, oh, no, by, uh, all, it's okay. by all means. This is great. I think that's, I think that's why they had you on. <laughs> just, no, my job, just asking some questions. I mean, just for me to understand, too, like art and I sure, about yeah. all of this. Like, so I, I asked Art, like, where do we begin? Because I, I don't know if you, I guess I'll ask you, like, do you believe there needs to be a change? Um, and if you do, I mean, where, where does this, where does it start? Well, you know, I don't know. That's my answer. I don't know. I mean, sure, there could be a change. You may need to fund other programs. First of all, you, you know what the thing they need to fund and deal with is mental illness. Because I've handled so many people that were absolutely batshit crazy that their parents, their family had tried to do something and it took until they killed someone and then it's too late, right? And because there's no, the mental health laws in this state and mostly all over the country are a joke. And, you know, there's no place to take these people before they get violent, right? I, I, Ian Stawicki walked into a, a coffee bar in Seattle and I was at this scene 2014 or 15, <clears throat> crazy as a loon and pulled out two guns and shot everybody in there, right? Killed like seven people and then went downtown and killed an innocent woman walking from her car to steal the car. <clears throat> and he'd been crazy for years and his family had been trying to get him help. But every time, you know, you, you if you put him in a, a mental uh, involuntary committal, that's a joke. They let him go almost, almost immediately. Yeah. And there's no, <clears throat> there's no funding or anything for handling the mentally ill. Not, you know, the vast majority of mentally ill are not violent, but you know, let's get to them before that happens, before they get to a point where they are violent and do some kind of treatment for them. Right. And instead I'm going down there, picking up the pieces, taking pictures of seven dead people and picking up showcase. And he, this guy, of course, Stewicki later today shot and killed himself when the police. Well, I think, him, I think him, you know, him. like you guys said, you know, there is a misconception in, def in defunding the police. It doesn't, I, I guess abolish the police is different than defund the police. Right. I would lean towards more the side of defund, meaning, you know, we still have homicide investigators and people, you know, there are people who do do really important calls like you were mentioning domestic violence, but allocating funds to things like homeless services, mental health services, things that, you know, are roots of these problems that, that really escalate so quickly. Um, is you know the way I would envision you know uh, a defunding going. Well, the other thing you got to realize <clears throat> when you're talking about things is how about everybody gets outraged about patrol officers out stopping people right and checking for guns, but thousands of black males are killed every year by other black males right, and in the I think I read 2,600, but that's not even a complete last year. That's not even a complete statistic because it leaves out 61 percent if they kill more than one. One person killed more than one. They didn't count it in the statistics. But anyway, so those people are killing people. And there are other black males that are killing them. If you take them and get them off the street, catch them with a gun or whatever, and put them away in the in the late 90s. to Well, in the, when I came on homicide in the, in the early 90s, the crack houses were out and homicide rates were through the roof. Then the early 2000s, they started being more proactive and stopping people and charging people with lesser crimes to get them off the street. And the homicide rates dropped. Now you see... Because there's not much policing going on because, first of all, they're being taken away for other things. And second of all, people, cops are saying, why would I stop that guy? Why would I take that chance? I get paid the same if I drive right by him. In Los Angeles, last week, a week before, in one week, there was a 220% increase in homicide rate. In New York, month to month, 100% increase in homicide rate. And who's getting killed? It's getting it's young black males. They're getting killed. I mean, not all of them, but the vast majority of those people are young black males. So black lives matter, but what about their black lives, right? I mean, like, I I have dealt with, I have dealt with looking into the eyes of a mother, well, hundreds of mothers, whose young men were killed on the street, and it doesn't matter if he was a dope dealer, doesn't matter if he's a gangbanger, they're still his mother, right? And they didn't want that to happen, so it's got to, it's the, the the problem is way before all that stuff. The problem is, you know, we got then you get into whole what's you know, society and you know do the reward gangster activity and, and, and make it, you know, cool in music and all that stuff. And then fathers that, you know, impregnate six different women and have nothing to do with the kids. I always made a point when I was talking to these suspects, I would ask, what's your dad doing? And they'd almost always say, I don't know my dad or he's in prison. And, you know, that's the root of the whole thing, right? They got to have some people, not that mothers cannot be great single mothers. And a lot of them are, I had a, I had a, I had a, uh, uh, 
young black male get murdered and he was completely innocent by the way not a criminal at all and but and he was in a single mother and his mother loved him so much and you know we actually became friends after that she would call me she was she was living in an area where there's a lot of violence and she said uh and she called me one day we were talking about something she said yeah, i'm moving out of this area because i said because i can't handle this violence and she's he's where are you going well, I'm going up and she told me the southern neighbor just going to her. I said, I just did three homicides in that neighborhood the other day. Don't move there. She goes, oh, my God. Thank you for telling. So I said, before you move to a place or buy a place, call me and ask me about the neighborhood. <laughs> and see, okay. So she did, right? And, and her son was on the street. He was coming home. But he was a you know, got a student working, had a job, going to go on a sabbatical over to Japan because he spoke fluent Japanese. And he got shot down in the street a block from our house. What about his life? Right. What about all the other people's lives? Again, all these, even if they're gangbangers and stuff, what about their lives? You know, do they not either? They're either. I'm telling you, today's suspect is tomorrow's victim. I so many people I handled for murder or suspected and had come a few days later and they're dead in the street. Right. And it's and if nobody's enforcing the little things to take them off the street before they become big things, then they end up getting killed. And you have thousands and thousands every year in the U.S. that get killed that way. That's where most black males are being killed by other black males. That's the statistic. That's well, true. And I can, I, I'm perfectly. I think, you know, and to just redirect because someone brought up accountability. I mean, I just do want to say that that is factually because of systemic racism in society going way back to redlining and white flight, but I don't want to go there. So in terms of <laughs> accountability, <laughs> um, like, you know, something Art brought up is, you know, he said the first thing that he would do to change the way things are is, get rid of police unions is what he said because the police union is the one who protected i'm not remembering the guy's name the one who killed george floyd who protected mm -hmm. him he had Very 17 against him. what chauvin yeah chauvin um so art you know who worked his way up from an officer to a marshal has said you know police unions that's the number one thing that we need to get rid of, to be able to hold people accountable. Cause I did see someone bring up accountability. I mean, what do you think about that? Well, first of all, let me tell you, people, I keep hearing this guy had 17 or 18 complaints against him. He was a patrol officer for 19 years. That's really not that high of a number. I've seen that. It's really not one a year, basically. And, you know, people complain for all, it, it doesn't matter the number of complaints. You have to look into what the complaints are and what the result was, because I mean, 17 or 18 complaints in 19 years is it sounds big, but it's not. If he'd been two years and 18, oh, that's big, but let uh, one a year or less than one a year is not. I mean, that means there are, I mean, I'm, I'm not defending this guy, I don't know anything about this guy or anything, but the number alone, he had he had tens of thousands of contacts over 19 years and had 18 complaints. So, I mean, that, that alone doesn't mean anything. So I, you know, I, you know I'm, in, I'm in a bad position because I've gotten a lot of benefits from police unions how many by, uh, by my payments and stuff. And uh, how many did I have? I worked the streets for 10 years. I had about 10 complaints, about one a year. And that's not, a, you know, for, I work patrol. So that's, I mean, and most of them are nickel and dime, nothing, you know. And, and, and you know, somebody said they just didn't like the situation in their piss. Sometimes the defense attorney would use that as a tactic. I used to get complaints. Here's the deal. When there was a big complaint, and I and everybody would go in like a big fight. I, I would be going to the fight with everybody else. I'd get called off and leave. And but they make a complaint. So they call everybody that responded to that call, whether they made it there or not, accused of a complaint. See, that's the numbers alone. You have to look under the numbers. What do they mean? Pull out every single case and go through them. How many were sustained? I don't know if any were sustained in his case. How many, you know, how many, how, what were the complaints about? Most of the time they're nickel well, and dime things. They're not even okay, that big. But um, in the specific case of, uh, the murder of George Floyd. What, uh, I mean, this guy had his knee on his back. No, no, I'm not, I'm yeah, not just then, finding this active. That came no, I know, I know. No. I, I, here, here's another, here's another fallacy. Everybody keeps talking about choking him from a knee on the neck. He didn't die from the knee on the neck. He died from the right. knee on the back because I mean, the autopsy said he didn't have any signs of strangulation. And he was, that's because when you put your knees on the back and hold for a long time, the guy can't, you can't inflate your diaphragm and you can't right. breathe full yeah. breaths. That was, and oh, that, no, you know, know. I'm not here to justify his action no, I know. at all. I, at all, I don't, and I don't know much about it. But I'm saying, yeah, that was terrible. What I, it was terrible. What I was asking, but about, I mean, just all this it, other have stuff. you ever seen anything like that on the street? Like you, you know. Well, first of all, you hold your knees on people when you're trying to get them down, but you don't leave it there for that long. You handcuff them, and the other thing is, everybody's trained. When the person starts, there's a thing called uh, 
excited delirium when somebody's high on cocaine. And they had, had a lot of people in the old days, they would die because, but their heart starts racing because the cocaine causes it. And you know, what you do, they train you, stop, sit them up, let them breathe and un unhandcuff them if you have to, but just set them up and make sure they're breathing. And that's what, I don't know what the heck this guy was thinking because that's basic. And that's what they should do. He said, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. They had him handcuffed. Get off him and sit him up and let him sit up sideways for a while. That's what they should have done. And I, but again, I wasn't there. I don't know anything about it, but that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's trained India ever since these excited delirium things that came up a lot in the early 2000s, late nineties, you know, when people were, when they have this hey, really high on cocaine and, and they get super hot and, uh, and they, you know, they do weird stuff. They walk, I had an excited delirium guy that took off his clothes and walked into the bay and drowned, you know, because he was just, um, I mean, I didn't. I wasn't there. I went there when he was found dead because they didn't know if he died. But it was exciting. You delirious. you brought up the case where the individual, because um, we were talking about mental illness as well, and and you said, and you know, it's right. it's totally accurate. There's not just one thing. I think I think too many people think that there's one thing that you know you can fix, and then that that fixes everything. This goes no, back is, hundreds of no. years, and it, and it, on both sides of it, you know, it goes it it goes back hundreds of years for people of color who have been oppressed for so long, and and people with mental illnesses, and also people who get out of the military, and the uh like the VA program here is garbage. Like we don't take care of our veterans; yeah. they have access to weapons, and they have right. mental illness, and we don't care about that. Um, yeah, I have a good I have a good friend who's a forensic psychiatrist, and he. It treats veterans, and his thing is, and he was a he was a uh, combat surgeon in Vietnam, and he's told me this all the time. Why are we spending money on VA? Give them the best medical card and send them out to private places, because it would be cheaper than setting up this whole VA thing, a VA hospital. My dad was a World War II combat veteran, and and during the end of, during the end of his life, I would take him to the VA. And let me tell you, first of all, the people at VA are fabulous. But the bureaucracy, I, he had an ingrown toenail one time. <clears throat> and I called and I said, uh, yeah, I need to make an appointment for him to get his toenails taken off. They said, well, we can see him in April. It was November. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> it was November. Yeah, we're going to wait till like for five months with ingrown. No, we're coming in tomorrow. And, and it's not them. It's just the bureaucracy. It's like any federal bureaucracy. You know, I mean, it's all. So how do so you how do you end the bureaucracy? So there's thing. another layer. Ah. Well, you get you get rid of bureaucracy. Yeah, you give the people a card, like a medical card. You go out to private people, and you go to and you would, the government would spend much much less less money on veterans and have much better care if they just send them out into the private medical field and have the VA pay for it in in, in like an insurance card, because it's just it's ridiculous. It's well, that's interesting. VA, Art, I, we're talking about uh, this too. Um, you know, his wife does mental health services for the marshals um you guys know sue right. so you know we were talking about that too he was talking about how much ptsd and trauma and how much you know oh, yeah. officers you know young guys going into the field how much on a daily basis they face and you know how much they mm -hmm. need mental health services as well you know when i started at seattle police there was actually a psychologist on staff and you could go see him anytime confidentially, but that got cut out of the budget years ago, right? You can't do that anymore. It was he would just had an office. You just call him up, say I want to come by, and he, you could come by. He was a police psychologist, and that was his job, employed by the police department. But they cut those out, you know. And that's something that was about. I, yeah, I didn't use it, but because I'm not crazy or nothing, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, that was a valuable service. And you know, but you're right. There is a lot of PTSD, I and mean, especially guys that are in shootings and yeah. stuff, or or it just not just shootings, but then really dramatic. And let me tell you. You see a lot of stuff, and some people. I I feel like I don't know what it is. I was kind of programmed correctly because this stuff didn't get to me. Not that I didn't feel empathy and stuff, but I could see the terrible things, everything terrible. You know, murdered stuff, people, pieces of body, and and go home and be normal, right? But I mean, that's just because I that's my makeup. I was like pre-programmed to do that job, but so some people can't. So that's, that's never that come out of you. Yeah. Like you never needed to uh, reflect upon. It. They said I was crazy, but they lied. <laughs> was your book sort of no, exercising I mean, no, I, uh, those issues? Maybe a little bit, you know. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I would. I, you know, when I had a problem, I'd go with my buddies to a bar, have a drink, right? <laughs> you know, and you know, this we had, we had. Uh, there was a th when I was working, there was a uh, whenever we had these big, like at the end, of crazy cases where you work thirty hours, and at the end, you go. 
I had a bottle of bourbon in the bottom of my desk. I pulled it out and everybody had a drink in the office, right? That's my therapy, right? We all sat around, have a drink, talk, and then go home. We're good. <laughs> but that's, you know, some people can't do that. Some people need more than that. And, that, and there's nothing wrong with people that need more than that. But, you know, the thing is, if that stuff bothers you that much where it's driving you crazy, this is and a job for you. You know, the thing is, I want to point out a comment. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Would, would you do that differently if you were to, to start your career over? Would you uh, take advantage maybe a little bit more of those kind of things? Well, you know, maybe. But again, I didn't, I never really felt like I needed to. I, because, well, first of all, I had a lot of really close friends and they were my psychologists, right? We would sit around, we could talk about stuff. And because they'd all experienced it too. It's kind of like group therapy without the guy with the beards running and everything, right? I don't know if you remember my book, the first murder I ever handled was a murder of a seven-year-old girl and the chief of police um, felt that if you handled a murder, ch uh, child murder, you had to go see a psychologist. So he set up this little group meeting. And of course it was the morning after we'd worked all night long getting the guy getting the guys, there were a couple of them, and I was tired. It was like 8 o'clock in the morning. I'd work all night long, put the people in jail, and I went in and sat down, and he's there, and he's got his beard and gold, and he looks at me. He goes, how do you feel about handling a case like this? And I looked at him, and this is my first murder I ever handled. I said, I feel like if I have to see somebody like you every time something like ha this happens, I'm in the wrong fucking line of work. I need to find another fucking job. And I got up and walked out the door. Of course, I was tired, but that's true. If it bothers you that much. Well, that's when I realized I couldn't, do uh, you know, be a mortician or work in any kind of like oh, pathology. Yeah. I saw my first autopsy and that, oh, not, yeah. you know, I watch enough um, no. murder shows to see pictures, but then when you <laughs> smell it, yeah, you know, the smells. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was yeah. done. Yeah, I, done. I know. I was. I was that way in the first in the twelve hundred and thirty fourth autopsy I saw. I'm <laughs> just talking, you know, about oh, let's our taco party for lunch, and I am cooking in a bucket on the other side of the room. <laughs> I, they do that on purpose. I remember being at a scene one time when I was patrol officer of this. Uh, back in this wooded area, it's actually right in downtown Seattle, but there was a big wooded lot and there was a decomposed body back there and there was a brand new officer and, and we, we walked back to my partner and I walked back there and this brand new student officer, they call me, he's in his field training is there and the, all the ribs are exposed and I'm looking at him, I look at my partner and goes, hey, that reminds me, go, let's have ribs tonight. Yeah, that, we did that on purpose, yeah. you know. I, I, just, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't point out a couple of comments before they uh, go fall to the wayside. Uh, Anna L. Uh, put, put a link here that said veterans are less likely to be involved in crime. And it's a link to a, uh, to an article about that. And cause I, I just, you know, I said that, I just want to make sure that, uh, that gets noticed that. No, yeah. And she yeah. also and actually veterans are more exactly likely to be victims that, yeah. of crime. No, that was my, yeah, that, that's <laughs> yeah, exactly victims, yeah. my point. Like they're, they're more yeah. likely to be victims. Um, and then she, same, same, mm -hmm. uh, Anna L writes here. What about guns? There's plenty of mental illness all over the world, but nowhere near the, uh, the, the homicide rate that we have. Um, what is it about the the what is what is it about that? I agree. You should keep guns out of mental, mentally ill people's hands. But the number of guns that are involved, law. I, first of all, I'm I, I'm all for a law abiding citizen who has no mental illness, no issues, having a gun to defend themselves. Because I know I've been to several scenes where people have defended themselves with guns, right? And it's and if 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 they hadn't had them, they would be dead. And you know, first of all, let me point out that. Um, 90% of people who defend themselves with guns never fire a shot, right? They just display the gun, which scares the person off, which is fine. But, you know, I'm guns are a fact of life, and they're, you're never going to change them. And uh, and I, like I said, and there's there's truth to this, to this saying, when the police are minutes away, I mean, when seconds count, the police are minutes away, and that's true. And, you know, I, I'd be, you know, I, of course, I'm a police officer. I have guns, a lot of guns. It, it would be pretty hypocritical of me to say, you can't have a gun, but I can have one, right, to protect my family. So as long as you're a law-abiding citizen and no, the vast, very, very few guns I've ever investigated or shootings or crimes are by someone who was legally owning the gun or possessing the gun. They're almost always stolen guns by convicted felons that couldn't have a gun anyway. So, I mean, it, it sounds good, but uh, it's... It's still not. I mean, like in London, they stab everybody to death, right? <laughs> they have huge stabbing problems. Kind of take away their knives. Right? So that I guess that brings, you know, Brianna Taylor, her boyfriend had a gun to defend themselves in the home when the police were there. And because of that, she wound up dead. Yeah, you know, I don't know enough about that case, Steve. I even, I've heard the name, but I don't even know any of the facts of that case. So, I mean, 
yeah, I don't know. I don't know what happened. So I, I, yeah, I'd be really, true. I can't even say anything. Yeah. I mean, if you're calling the police, don't come to the door with a gun. Because <laughs> yeah. the police are paranoid. No, right? they, they, they had a no knock shot warrant the time, and yeah. uh, broke. Oh, that's right. I did hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And again, I don't know enough about that case to comment really. Yeah. No. That's cool. What about the uh, the chokehold? I know there's been some talk about that lately um, out there in policing. Like, Which, uh, yeah. yeah, how well, common first, is yeah. that? Well, I don't know why. Well, it the cho the the rule they passed about the chokehold only can use it in lo in uh, life or death situations. That's been the rule here where I work yeah. since the mid '80s, right? Because I mean. It was a good tool back in the old days and when people could really do it well because you knock somebody unconscious for just a few seconds. But if you do it even a little bit wrong, you can kill them. And I don't know why it came up because this this case with George Floyd had nothing to do with a neck restraint, right? It had nothing to do with a chokehold. Chokehold is a sleeper hold around the back of the neck. But they do it in, in uh, MMA and stuff all the Eric time. Garner and, yeah. case, which now, like, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. And you know, the problem is if your hand slips a little bit, you put it across the bar. You have you have to have the the, the windpipe in the crook of your elbow because that lets it stay there, and you pinch off the carotid artery just enough to make the person pass out for a second, and then they then you handcuff them. They come right back in like two seconds. But you know that was that was the we used to joke about in the mid '80s. Whenever I was a patrol officer at the time, the choke don't choke school, and they <laughs> you can't choke, so they wanted you to beat the shit out of them with a nightstick instead. That was what they taught us. Really, we had nightsticks. We were beating the shit out of rolled up mats and then bodies and. That's what you want. I mean, I, I never used, I was never a chokehold guy, but I mean, I agree. It, it is dangerous and the chance of killing somebody is probably pretty serious. So you can only use it in, where you can use deadly force. And and I have no problem with that. But like I said, that's been the rule where I work for so 25, 30 years. So interesting worked. enough, yeah. Arthur <laughs> yeah. um, did defend the chokehold. This was one of the things. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a good tool yeah. if you know how to he, do it right. He, yeah. You know, he said that he had to use it once, and he was explaining this situation to me. Back in the day, you know, he showed up to a domestic complaint. Uh, the guy tried to pull a handgun on him. Um, so they started fighting one-on-one. -on -one. He said the only way he got the gun away was to chokehold the guy. Um, of course, in that situation, even today, you could do that because that's well, you could have shot the guy. My next thing I wanted to ask yeah. you, which I also asked Art, was there's this whole like eight can't wait campaign, and this is like the eight things that people are saying that that uh, lawmakers can do to immediately decrease the amount of officer involved shootings that happen, and one of them is just or officer deaths, I guess is banning chokeholds. I think just like outright, they want to just outright ban them. And Art said, well, I, I don't, that's, I don't agree with that is what Art. No, you can't outright ban it. You could, you could say you can only use it in a situation where you can use deadly force, right? Cause you're probably not going to kill the guy. Yeah. You could accidentally. So, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, like if you're disarmed, first of all, it doesn't matter what the law is when your life is on the line, right? There's a, there's a, there's a saying better be tried by 12 than carried by six. So, you know, if if you lost your gun and you're in a fight for your life, I don't care what the right, law is, you're going to choke the guy out, right? You'll deal with that later, and that but that's the way it should be, and 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 you know what, you'll never get charged with anything because you'll, if your life was on the line, but uh, and that you know that's that's I think that's I honestly think that's probably the way it is all over the country already. I think that's feel good legislation because I don't think that it will affect it because I think. Pretty much the whole country. I know LA was that way up and down the West Coast. I'm pretty sure. So the whole one of these things I hadn't there. heard about that Art brought up, and it is also on this eight can't wait that they want to do this. But I, apparently, Art said this has always been in policing. But I think they want to make it like a universal law because I think the problem is that every state, every county, every city, everyone has different, you know, rules and regulations. Is right. this? Um, it's called required use of force continuum. Yeah, there's a, yeah, that's a the continue. Yeah, well, although you know this continuum, it doesn't mean you have to start at one, two, three, four. Because if you do that, when you when it's a deadly force thing, you get to two and you'll be dead, right? You but you do start it and you work your way up one, 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 one. That's well, I think standard, standard too. I think the thing but, is, is that it should be uh, required. It should be you know best practice. And if officers aren't doing this, they should be reprimanded. They should be looked at. Like I think that's kind of what, I think what it's is more it? of like what you know. That's what Art said. He, been there and you what know good cops like you and him do that but a lot of guys okay so 
It's yeah, what, what is that? So basically, you continue. know, you start at the lowest. Drop your, weapon, drop your weapon. Okay, they didn't drop the weapon. Take out a baton if you have a baton. You know, it, you start at the lowest use of force, and then it gradually goes up to, okay, now I have to physically pull out a taser. Now I have to pull out my gun. Um, but you well, first of all, and that's true, but again, if the guy's already got a gun out, you're going to go right to 10. You cannot stop. You can't tase somebody with a gun. You can't tase somebody with a knife. You can't say, stop, drop your gun, because you'll say, drop your, and you'll be dead, right? That's not the way it works in the real world. It's, the, most of the decisions on what happens are with the person being handled, right? So, I mean, if it's something where the guy's acting up and get, like, for example, in the case in Atlanta, you, you work your way to, hey, stop, stop, stop. And then it, they did use a continuum of force. Well, I think, and, yeah, but it didn't I think work, we're right? on the same page. And, like, I, I don't, yeah. I would never tell an officer who, you know, a guy is wielding a gun at him, but I don't think we're necessarily talking about those cases. I think we are talking about some of these cases. Eric Garner killed in a chokehold, selling Lucy's. He didn't have a gun. He wasn't doing it. I think we're talking more about, you know, these mm -hmm. instances. Well, those and those and that is the standard most places. And the thing about it, you know, the, the, the Eric Garner brings up a whole other thing. The city sent him out there to do these stupid ass little selling loose cigarettes. Who gives a shit, right? Why are the police spending their resources doing that? Because the city wanted them to, because he's right. costing them tax money. Well, That's the problem. Problem. There <laughs> yeah. are so many That's issues that are bigger yeah. that need to be looked at. And Eric Garner yeah. should not have died. That should of course, Eric Garner had a lot of heart issues and stuff that caused problems. Sure, like, but it's also like that chokehold. You know, if a man is screaming at you, I can't breathe. At what point do you yeah. release and realize, you know, there's five other, five or six other guys here. Well, we can handle them. Uh, you know, again, I was, I don't, I don't, I, I know about the Eric Garner case. I didn't see the whole thing. But you're right. Yeah. And that should have, there are continuous. That's as far as I know. Again, I only know about what I see in, and talking to people from all over the country. That's been standard. I went, I went to the academy in 1979. We learned that in 1979. That's not anything new. See, they, and maybe there are some places that don't do that, but that's was, everybody's been doing that forever. And then they got right? acquitted. That's, that's and I think that's is. kind of where art was going with the unions. It's like, what? At what, how are these guys getting acquitted when you killed a man in a chokehold that? Well, first of all, the guy in Eric Garner didn't get charged. They were, right? they he were, they charged. got charged like a year or two. It was like years, years, years later. Yeah. Was it? Okay. Yeah. I thought they didn't. Anyway. Um, but, you know, the thing is, once you get charged, the union's not going to help you, right? It's all about, it's all about the, your attorney and the jury and all that stuff. And the case you present and what the prosecutor, sometimes, a lot of these times, I think, first of all, the prosecutors are quick to charge guys or they overcharge them, right? They overcharge them with something they could never prove. And then you get to court and they can't prove it. You know, that's the problem. So, and you lose the case. Like, I, there's a danger. I can see a danger in this George Floyd case that they overcharge it. And they may lose it because of that, because they charge way too high because they let emotions get it. This is why when these things happen, some other person from some other place should make those decisions, not the people right there that are all in the middle of the fire. Because when they, oh, let's dump it up to murder one or murder, you're never going to be able to charge that, right? You, you know, that's a manslaughter. That's what that is. And it's the appropriate charge. But don't if you overcharge it and you try to prove murder one, you get a not guilty because you don't have the facts to fit the pattern. And that's the thing these prosecutors got to worry about. You know, you can't go just because everybody's riled and, and rah, rah, rah. You have to go with what the facts are in every case. It's the same whether, you know, it's the same when I was investigating any kind of murder. If it's a murder, it's a murder. If it's a manslaughter, it's a manslaughter. Don't overcharge them. I mean, I used to have some arguments with people. They over undercharged, of course. Well, but, I agree with that. But, uh, and I think, again, yeah, that just gotta, goes yeah. to the system. Like, we need some kind of reform where we can, you know, hold officers who do something very terribly wrong. Like with George Floyd, I think everyone agrees. Everyone I've talked to agrees that was not officers as well. I have a lot of friends in the NYPD. You know, that was not okay. So at what point? Yeah, we, they should have turned them over and set them up. And not let sit and hold the other body back under the back. I don't know what the heck he was saying. You know, I feel sorry for the other the other two guys. They had that was yeah. like their fourth day on the police department. They're supposed to go in there and tell this guy, stop, stop, stop. They don't even know what they're doing, right? They're brand new on a job. They're going, well, this must happen all the time. I don't know. And so that's really unfair to throw those people under the bus, I think. Because they're brand new guys in, in field training sure. who had no 
you know, the, yeah. If I go in here and interview with this, they could fire me because I wasn't doing the right thing. They don't know what's yeah, going on, right? They they're just, they didn't, they didn't the know. Street. They've just gotten there. That's something they else I already talked yeah. about on this list that people want, you know, to enact immediately, which is um, a, a duty to intervene. Make it a responsibility, a have to. If you don't do this, then you will get in trouble. If you if it's if it's obvious and it, it is kind of although again you hold you hold these guys with 40s on to the that to that level are they going to interfere with some veteran I officer with you? i mean they're like it's sure. like you're on a ride along right you don't I even do know that's a stigmatizer yeah a sympathy for that officer but also as a yeah. human being i would have intervened you know like i couldn't watch someone fucking dying like, it, it was well, they probably didn't realize he was gonna die. These young guys, I'm talking about, until it was too late. You know, like uh, going, Chris, oh, oh, you know, Chris Duet has <laughs> so, a, I don't know. a question: yeah. uh, Should field training officers be allowed to go hands on in a George Floyd situation? Well, you have to. You're a field training officer. You're an officer. You do whatever it calls for. You can't say I can't go hands on because I'm a field training officer. Then what happens, right? You have to. You're an officer. The whole point of field training is to learn it in the real world. And you know you have to do whatever you have to do, and I mean, do, do I think he should have done this? No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying you can't restrict what a field officer can do because he may be the only officer there with any experience, and it could spiral out of control. Then whatever whatever the situation is, but so you have to you can't restrict what field training officers can do. Oh, you talking about the officers that that are being trained? They have to be there too because they have to learn. I mean, you have to do what your field training officer tells you to do. But um, to a certain extent, but I mean, obviously, if you if you know it's obviously wrong, then you don't have to, right? But I mean, those guys probably didn't know it was obviously wrong. No, I do, they, I do think. Didn't. I mean, I, any human can see that was pretty wrong. I, we're yeah. talking about the. We're well, talking I mean, about the officers and George Floyd. George Floyd. Yeah. George I, I think after I think after three and a half minutes, yeah. they should I'm have talking known about that the other was obviously wrong. Well, they should have, but again, these guys. This is their fourth day in the police department on the street. What kind I mean, of training? Like, what kind of training do they know, go they do, into they before do. they hit the streets with their? Right. Well, they go to the police academy. They go to the police academy, right? And it's all theory and you know mock scenes, and this is real life, so it's different, right? It's you, you learn the basics, but then you go out in the street and learn real life. And I'm not saying you know these guys. I'm not saying they should not have, but you know, in their minds, they're thinking. Well, first of all, they probably didn't even realize how serious this was until it was too late because they, they'd never experienced this before, right? It's easy to call after you know what's going to happen in the end to say you should have done that. But when you're there at the time and you don't know, you know, you, I mean, because you, and you're really an, exper an experienced officer would have probably said, hey, get off, get off and let's set them up. Come on, you know, that's the thing. If you had another officer there that was more experienced, that probably would have happened. It didn't happen in this case. But I, you know, and I don't know what's going on in Minneapolis, right? But, but, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it's that yeah, it was a bad situation yeah. all the way around. Yeah, uh, that guy Chauvin just seems like a total dick. Obviously, well, it turns out he knew Floyd and actually right. wanted. Yeah. yeah, that was a weird situation too. They worked. He worked off. He was like very he clearly like a racist piece of shit. Teaching him from work a lesson. Like he was yeah. a bad guy, Chauvin. I don't know. I don't. I you know. I, I don't know what was going on with that. Usually, when you if you know a guy, it's a lot easier to talk to him, right? Because you know, I talk to these guys. You know, I'd I'd see these guys and hey, come on now, you know this? Oh yeah, yeah, sorry man, you know. And, you know. But then again, I I've also had guys that I knew who were screaming crazy on drugs. They had to fight with, and were you know big fight, and it was all over, and they went to jail. And when they got out a few days later, they came and saw me and said, hey, Stagger, man, I'm sorry. I was crazy. I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. But, you know, because you're crazy on drugs. Right? How or long, alcohol, whatever. if those officers had been on for a week or so, it, it would, would that be enough time for them to have seen, like? Well, yeah. maybe, you know, it's hard to say. A month or so probably is a better guess. A month, or, yeah. First of all, they, if they'd ever been trained in that, but, you know, you think about, it. suppose you're a brand new guy at a job and you have a boss because this field training officer to them is their boss and he's doing something. How likely are you in the first week to say, mm -hmm. hey, you shouldn't do that? Right. Not very likely. Right. You know, because you're trying to just do your job. Right. But so, so you got to look at it that way. I'm not saying them, again. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't off. have, but yeah. apparently, apparently, yeah. yeah. Training them how to kill right. somebody. He, had, he was a 19 year old guy, always in patrol. I mean, yeah, honestly, if case, that's not systemic racism, I don't know what is. 
Well, again, I'm you know I'm I'm real big on it's about behavior. It's not about race, right? Because I mean, there are white thugs and there are black thugs and there are Hispanic thugs and there's thugs in every race, and you don't treat them different yeah. a white thug from a black thug when you're dealing with them, right? It's just it's not it's not the race. It's just the, it's the behavior or the culture, I guess, what they're doing. It, you know, so I'm I'm not real quick to jump on because he was a black guy. He did this. If he was a if he had if he'd been I, again, I'm not going to blame. George Floyd for what happened, but say a white guy was fighting with the officers, it would have been just as likely that they'd have taken him down than a, than a black guy. I I just think that that's the reality because there's a lot of yeah. I dealt I, in my entire my entire patrol career, I worked in predominantly black areas, and I met and I knew a lot of people who were very good people, and I dealt with them every day, see them on the street, or even they're just you know maybe they're just you know they're not like. Uh, you know, I'm just saying maybe they're hanging out, but they're not bad people, right? They're just guys. And so, you know, I just see him and talk all the time and, but and, and didn't go after him because they were, they were black. And if that was the case, I wouldn't like him because they're black, but I dealt, I deal with everybody was black. Right. I got, and let me tell you how many times I went into a black neighborhood and the thugs on the corner gang banging and dealing drugs and getting them out of there and to have some black man who's trying to raise his kids there come out and say, thank you for them. I don't want my kids around these guys, you know, because they have to live there, right? I ha- I live out in the suburbs. I don't have to live in this in this thing, but they those people have to live there when this stuff's going around and the gang banging and all that stuff. And they don't they're they're the ones that are calling nine one one, right? They're the ones that are calling nine one one because they're just trying to live their life in their home like everybody else should. So I mean, it's 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 not a it's not a, no no pun intended black and white situation. But in the case of I mean, it's Floyd, a, it's it gray, seems like it was because. Areas, yeah. Yeah, it seems like it was yeah, because I don't know Chauvin yeah, yeah. knew him, whether whether he's racist, yeah, a person, or not. whether there was animosity, know. but but it's yeah, I, I, big, I, I, but it's obviously yeah, the whole exactly. thing is bigger than the the Floyd incident, you know. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah so yeah, where do you so, where yeah. do you stop these uh, yeah. thugs from, or how do you how do you prevent these thugs from having this lifestyle in the in the first place? Like we have to go back to re. Well, that. No, that's not no that is my job. point. Yeah, that is not the police's the police job. The, the police, yeah, exactly. the police are, are yeah. part of the the police are the part of the reaction, the reaction that's been going on for yeah. for hundreds of years. Yeah. Right. That goes into whole yes. families and you know and, and and raising your kids right. First of all, let them put them in schools where they can learn the best. Don't leave them stuck in terrible schools. You know, I, I again, I'm not going to get into the whole teachers union stuff, but if you have a, a family that wants their child to go to a different school because they're much better, why don't we let them, right? Why do we keep them in failed schools where they don't have a chance? And then it, I can't tell you when I was, when I was an officer, in, well, even when I was a detective early on, I would deal with third and fourth generations of the same families that were all committing crimes. And I mean, I, 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 I used to, I got a guy for murder one time and I said, I arrested your grandpa. And they would say, Oh, that's my great grandpa. Cause there'd be 15 years between generations. Right. And th- that's a whole problem. Right. And that's the whole thing. Teach, teach young men to be good men and take care of any children they have. And, you know, and, and there are a lot of examples. I mean, I'd see these people living in the same neighborhoods, but the kids are great because they got a family that's there for them and does things for them, right? And they're just and they're doing the right thing and they're learning in school and they're not getting sent to you know terrible schools and, and just running the streets all night every night. And, you know that's a society thing. It's way like I said, that's way all before right. the police get involved. We're the reaction to what, what happens when you what don't. Get, right? That's exactly right. Not that the police can't get involved in other ways and you know mentor and things. You know, well Shaquille O'Neal is a perfect example. Shaquille O'Neal was a single, was raised by a single mom in the ghetto, right? And he says that he wants, right now he's still, he's a reserve officer somewhere, and he wants to be a sheriff. Because when he was a kid, there was a local cop that took him under his wing and mentored him and turned him into the man he was, and he appreciates that. So we can do that kind of stuff, right? But it's up to the people. Love your kids. Be involved in their lives. Tell them you love them. Go to their games. What are good schools? They all start, it's all basic stuff, but you'd be surprised at stuff. Yeah, you know, I go to these houses, these little kids, two years old, sitting in a crib screaming. They've been in there all day long. Two years old in a crib, but been wet their pants hours and hours and hours ago. And that's the problem. That's well, you no, start. you gotta you, you and, and once you get yeah, to exactly. But you gotta you start, you have to figure out where to start beyond that, like deeper than that. It's not yeah, it's not just yeah, like go up to oh, yeah. these families and say, listen, there's a good school down the street. You have to, I mean, some of these, 
No, 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 no. And, and parents have to care. Well, to begin yeah, with. but beyond that, <laughs> people had to, to have cared for those parents, and and people had to have cared for the parents before them. Right. Yeah. yeah it's exactly. It's a cycle. It's a cycle. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. yeah. It's an endless cycle, and that's you know it's it's well beyond my pay grade to figure that out. But it's societal. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not racial. It's not anything. But just people just have to because this this these things happen in white families too. Unfortunately, it's it's disproportionate in some black families, but. But the reality is it happens, I, you know, there, there are white families that have generation after generation of people that are in trouble. And I deal, I used to deal with them all the time, too. But, you know, the thing is, you just it's, that's what it's all about. It's about parenting. It's about not glorifying the lifestyle of people in gangs and street stuff and, and having respect for women and not calling them bitches and hoes and all this kind of stuff. You know, that's the type of thing. And, and, and take it, it, I don't, if you get somebody pregnant, whatever, be there for the kid, right? Even if it, it, I don't care how old you are, just be there for the kid. You don't even have to marry the mother, but be there for the kid. That's so huge because I mean, it's yeah. not the kid's fault. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about something that is so, so deep, like it so, so deep in like our, mm. our, our, our history. It's like, we, you have to go back in and just kind of like pull the rot out. And how do you do that? And how do you, how do you, how do you regrow? You do. Yeah, that's exactly um, right. Just, yeah, just that's exactly right. Bef- you got to start yeah. somewhere before we get on this. Uh, before we get it. on this, Maggie <laughs> was sending us screenshots of someone who's a former military uh, investigator, um, police. seemingly oh. police, police, former police, yeah. who is who is now threatening her life because, right. uh, according to him, she's a libtard right. who won't who won't shut her mouth. Literally, literally threatened to stab yeah. her. Like it's well, not even. Know, I'm not even exaggerating. So right. where where did it go wrong in his family? Because he mm-hmm. seemed like he was growing up. Pretty, yeah. I don't know. Well, what did he, is he a combat veteran? He's got PTSD issues. I don't know. But there again, you're right. It doesn't matter yeah. because it's, it's the same thing. He has to, he has to, he has to um, learn yeah. to respect women and it doesn't matter if you don't agree with them politically, you know, but all that stuff, it's all, it's not just, like I said, it's everybody. It's, it's everybody. It's, that's the way it's all of society, you know, just let everybody be nice. That's all you gotta do. <laughs> it's so easy. <laughs> You know, don't and don't kill people. <laughs> <laughs> it's frowned upon in some circles. Seems like pretty <laughs> simple. <laughs> Although I made a good, I got, I made a good living because of that, yeah. so I can't complain too. Bad. Definitely but, frowned uh, upon. <laughs> yeah, it's frowned upon. Let's not yeah. bicker about who killed who. Uh. So, geez, it's already Just like 10 that. O'clock. I can't believe it. Uh, Guys, usually there for. you go. What's that? How long do you usually do them for? What's that? One hour usually. Well, yeah, we, we, figured we, we figured we'd tackle <laughs> police brutality, systemic racism, or systemic racism, um, guy parody. We figured we'd cram it all into an hour. What else you got? What yeah. else you got? Come on, hit me. We <laughs> did a lot. Yeah, yeah. We, we'll go just deep enough yeah, to like frustrate was... everybody and, and uh, not. <laughs> no, that's the thing. People just got to stop and think about the little things, right? right. The little things. That's yeah, really well, just be nice each to other. everybody. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Respect is there something in policing about, though that you've seen specifically and maybe it's not something you've done, but maybe someone you've worked with has done uh that you think needs to not be present anymore. Maybe it was a norm at, at a certain point. Would that be No, maybe it was a norm at a certain point um in policing. Well, oh, not you know I saw a lot of stuff, but I never, I never saw anything that shocked my conscience or anything like that. No, I mean the, the, the re- reality is, ninety-seven percent of cops are out there doing a good job, and you know, respecting people and stuff like that. And, but in, in any group of people, you can always have a couple of odd ducks that shouldn't do that for a living. You know that goes back to the hiring process and psychological screening and all that kind of stuff. But you know, it, it's been. Well, I, I've had a great career. I've always, I said it a lot. I've worked around a lot of great people. I've done a lot of cool things and uh you know they paid me to do it i can't believe it but so that's yeah i haven't really i haven't really seen people that you know really are, that i thought was uh, nothing on the level of what like the george floyd thing or anything like that no like you know old boys club like oh we cover for each other it's the thin blue line no i mean no yeah no the, well the thin blue line is something that's really 
uh, misrepresented the thin balloon as a line between civilized society and anarchy, right? But I mean, it's it, and people use that to say cops all circle. I mean, you know, the thing is, do cops do look out for each other? But if you're really bad, nothing a good cop hates worse than a bad cop, and it, there's no, there's no, there's none of that there. So it's all about the thin blue line is completely taken out of context. It has nothing to do with us against them. It's the exact opposite. It's us protecting them, right? We're the thing is you're the sheepdog, right? You're, you, you're friendly and laughing and ha 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 all the time. But when the wolf comes, then you're then you're on, on alert and you're going to be aggressive. So that's what you know. That's what people call themselves now against sheepdogs, and it's, and that's a good thing because you talk about you know when I'm around no, when I'm around people and they want me, I can, you can you can walk up to me in a coffee shop and talk to me. Two of my sons are patrol officers right now, you know, in Seattle, and and one of them was just telling me he was in a Starbucks the other day after all this shit went on, and some old black guy came up to him and says, "Hey, officer, I want to buy your coffee because he goes, no, no, hey, somebody else already did." But he sat and talked to him for like 45 minutes, and the guy was a really nice old guy, and that's the thing, you know, that's it's most, that's the way most people are. You just deal with it. You can't, you can't for sure, you can't listen to everything you hear in the news, right? As far as all this. Uh, terrible stuff going on because reality is um if there aren't cops around things are gonna get really bad and a lot more people are gonna die or get hurt and that's the thing and, and i know that maggie doesn't isn't calling for that or anything else i'm just saying there's a big misunderstanding about what uh the police do and they didn't just drive around looking for people to hassle right it's they get they go to these things because somebody called 911. you know most of the time they don't just go show up at a scene and even less now. Actually, they should more. That's called proactive work. Even less now because of all the crap going on. So they you've never everything. So you've never seen a cop personally that's like sort of in it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. No, not that. No, no. There's nobody. I've never seen any. I mean, there was one guy when I was when I was a, just before I left patrol, and he wasn't. And he, he was. He would just go in. He was working by himself in a car, and he would go into these disturbances by himself and then the big fight would be on and a matter of fact at the end i called him out at the precinct and i walked him out took him out to the car deck and i said you know i basically dressed him down i was a senior guy about to go to detectives and he was a new guy and you know i dressed him down and i said what the hell are you doing you know and you know a couple of years later he was gone i don't know where he went but uh I mean, he not that he was a bad cop but he would just do stupid stuff going in by himself to situations we need two or three officers minimum and causing Something to blow up that we probably could have handled more if we had enough people. Because if one guy goes in, all these guys are thinking, well, we could take this guy, right? But if three or four go in, they're like, oh, we're not going to do this, right? So that's yeah, the, that's thing. the kind of officer that, that you know, ends up doing something really stupid, you know, or gets killed, or right. gets killed. Yeah, one or two. Yeah, I think yeah. part of the problem is yeah. some, some. The, the reason why it's such a heavy, uh, such a strong spotlight on police officers is because. They're supposed to be there when you call nine one one. They're supposed to help. That's that's, that's what right. we that's what we're told. Like they're right. supposed to help. And then when you see this going the other way, where they're not helping, when it, it the appearance is that they're they're killing people, that and and I'm not I'm just saying like that's the appearance. And there's a there's there's something yeah. that has to be implemented in the training, and maybe there is that I just don't know of. But there there we know of police officers that abuse their power. And 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 they know that because are, yeah. they 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 know they're they're automatically either intimidating or they are going into a situation where they're supposed to be helping. And I don't and I don't I don't know right. like what what to do. I don't know if there's training on how to like handle well, handle that power. Well, there is, but you know it, it depends on the individual. But you know one thing I like to point out when people say about. It, there were, I, I looked this up, 5.3 million contacts between police and, and people last year. Of those, uh, let me see what my numbers are. There were 10 million arrests and 1,000 use, uses of deadly force. That's not necessarily deaths. That's a deadly force. So that's 0.02% of all contacts, which is is not high. It's, it's, a, it's not good if any of those were not good uses of force. But still, that's a very low number. We had a 5.3 million police citizen contacts in one year and yet we're still calling for some sort of reform no that's the thing that because they because well first of all normal use of force i'm not talking about the george floyd stuff is ugly right it's ugly people that didn't see it before they watch adam 12 where the woman puts a wrist hook lock us oh, oh, oh well that's not how it is in the real world right real the, the, the real use of force and most good force is overwhelming and quick 
so it's you know you don't want it to last more than five or ten seconds. That's ideal, because the, the, the if it lasts longer than that, chance of somebody getting seriously hurt is pretty bad. So you have to you know, it's quick and overwhelming, but it looks ugly, and people are seeing it now because the cameras everywhere. And well, that's not what I saw in Adam Twelve, and that's not what I saw in that movie once, because the movies aren't what real. It's like in Vietnam, you know, everybody had these ideas of what the war was until the cameras start showing up and they saw how terrible war was. And they thought that was a worse war. That wasn't a worse war. Matter of fact, compared to World War II, that was nothing. But everybody's seeing it, right? So it's just a matter of perception. You have to have a realistic perception of what force looks like. And it isn't pretty. It's 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 ugly. But, you know, the thing is, sometimes... So I, I do have a question. You know, a lot of people are talking and posting about, you know, people who go to hair school get uh, go to school like a thousand more hours than officers do. I mean, should they be trained longer, more? Well, that's uh, actually, that's not really true because I started in 1979 and you know when I was done with my training? 2016, because I had to train every single year about different stuff, right? So, I mean, your, your initial set of training, well, you know, I mean, right now in Washington, anyway, the police academy is six months. And then you have, in, in Seattle, then you have another three months. And then you have three months, at least, of street training, field training, and then you have probation. And, but you're continually training during that time. You're going back for more training all the time. So it's it's like a continue. Training doesn't ever stop until you stop, until you're done with your career. I'm done with my well now. I now I give training because I teach a lot, and uh, but but I mean I I still go to conferences and stuff and learn stuff. It's just it doesn't ever. Well, there, stop. there there so, there's a rumor out there yeah, that you officially stopped after you did our show, and you're like I can't learn anymore. Mm -hmm. I can't I, learn. That's I, it. I'm done. The pinnacle yeah. of my knowledge. <laughs> I can. I, I'm teaching a Zoom class next week on interview interrogation. It'll be my first. I've taught that class 50 times. It'll be my first time by Zoom. So it'll be. Yeah. Yeah. Do a cool uh, virtual <laughs> background. Can you give us yeah, any, yeah, uh, any techniques uh, before we go? I could do that, except for then, if you ever got done. Uh, but for a hundred bucks a piece, at least, we'll send you some beef lines. Kidding. <laughs> no, it's hey, you know, this is the first thing I say when I'm teaching interview interrogation. It's an art, not a science, right? <laughs> so it doesn't. There's no one size fits all for this. You have to develop your own skills. But there are some basic things you have to do, and one of them is be prepared to talk for long. I've had six, seven hour interrogations and the best interrogations are the ones where the suspect doesn't know he's being interrogated right it's just a conversation just you and i talk right? i'm not the guy with the suit and the tie sitting across the desk like going to the principal's office i'm the guy hey i'm Cloyd. what's going on <laughs> that's my interrogation. Oh, let's start sometimes i just want to what the hell happened sometimes i just want to come in just here? so you can interrogate me. <laughs> we can do it yeah he come on by the way remember i was telling you my buddy is a chief in new hampshire should, I remember, he's like new hampshire. interrogation he's for you guys yeah. you guys should do something bad and he should interrogate you oh we could, except for it'd be hard over the computer. It'd have to be in person because there's so much to do with the setting and physical location between you and them and all that kind of stuff. It can't, it, it won't, it won't translate well oh, over the man. computer. Do you smoke cigarettes when you, when you're in there? Is it like yeah. a big smoky room? <laughs> I, I don't, but I don't, but let me tell you what, I don't smoke, but, I, I, but if I'm there and the guy says, can I have a cigarette? Hell yeah, you can have a cigarette. Some people say, I'm sorry, there's no smoking in this room. This is a pub. It, 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 exactly. Here's a quote from my from my when I'm teaching that. <laughs> fuck that. <laughs> Give the fucking guy a cigarette, right? You're asking about a murder. You're gonna have him shut down because he can't have a cigarette. I don't give a shit what the rules are. Give him a goddamn cigarette. <laughs> That's the thing. And so I'm stuck in these rooms and they're smoking for a guy who's never smoked in his life. <laughs> it kills me. But you know, I smell like I came from a casino when I get home, right? <laughs> uh, well, Chris, Chris, do it. Yeah. Chris, do it. Just, to, uh, just lawyer time. up and watch <laughs> Cloyd's head explode. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You'd be surprised how many people don't, <laughs> especially if you're so calm and low low key, you know, and non threatening. It's like, even guys, and, and the other thing is like serial killers. I've never had a serial killer lawyer up. You know why? Because they think they're smarter than me and they can fool me. That's why. So I just let them think they are and let them believe it. And then, you know, I hand out the rope and hand out the rope. I have, I have, tapes of like six hours of one serial killer who's telling me all these things and it's like when i went to trial they could, the jury was like you could sit there and listen to that stuff that's what they said afterwards oh my god i'd be freaking i go oh, no, he's just like spilling <laughs> it 
Oh, yeah, yeah, just spelling it out. Well, first of all, the serial killer, once you get the first one, then it's easier to get the, the next ones, right? And once you get, yeah, you know, once the first, like anything else, once that first domino falls, then they all just kind of fall in a chain. And that's, you're just trying to knock over that first domino. So that's what happens. All right. Wow. wow. Good right. stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. This has been yeah. a great night. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maggie and Cloyd, for joining <laughs> us here tonight on Get Vocal. I, I hope we've learned something. I, I know there were uh, there were some uh, interesting moments in here, and I've got to listen back to really reflect on what the hell just happened. Well, you know what? All, we keep talking <laughs> about, like, what, what do we need to do? Like, what, how can we change stuff? How can we change things? Where does it start? Where does it start? Conversations like this is where it starts. You know, people listening to this conversation and right. and – and taking something away that maybe we're not taking away. Maybe, maybe we are taking something right. away that's different from, you know, Chris Duet or Jason or Shannon. And that's where it starts. So, cause they're going to use that mm -hmm. and they're going to start talking to people and we're going to start talking to people and we can all, we can have different opinions. I mean, Claude, you, you, you're, you're a career, your sons are law yeah. in, in, in law enforcement. You're in law enforcement. Every, yeah, you know it's Tons, it's yeah. it's in, we don't have that background. So to hear to hear like just like the right. the process of certain things is very interesting. And there isn't supposed to be a single a single shaming of one particular industry. I, I said last week, like if lunch ladies were if if a few lunch ladies were poisoning kids when they were giving uh, lunches out at school, I wouldn't be like anti lunch ladies and let's you know. Damn lunch ladies. Ladies. you know so there's so many <laughs> layers to this and yeah i love those oh. nets in their hair oh. what, do you, what do you mean <laughs> their hair yeah shannon we'll talk about that later we are very fortunate to have a platform where we can have uh law enforcement come on and speak to us because that is how how change does happen you know what some of us right. live in echo chambers where it's just activists or it's just whoever and i think from both sides you know is right. very important so thank you Floyd. the biggest the biggest takeaway is it's it's not nothing's cut and dry in this right mm -hmm. there are varying degrees of everything right? yeah. it's all i'll stop using the yeah. lunch lady uh, analogy anyway. i it's been it's only been a week and it's already <laughs> old <laughs> i was trying to remember jesus <laughs> Well, thanks, everybody. This has been a uh, a great time. And, All right. uh, yeah. Nice.